everybody and welcome to another edition of the Social Wave Project podcast. My name is Sarah Francis but everyone calls me Sez and I'm going to be continuing with my Titanic episode special this week for Titanic Titan of the Sea but I'm not going to lie to you, I'm a little bit nervous about this interview because I have got a very special guest who has come on today and I was so nervous about everything and I know I can't speak but I, I know I'll just, uh, I'll keep flowing as time goes on but today I am joined with Tom Linsky. Tom, hello. Hello, how are you doing? Not too bad, thank you. Yourself? I'm, I'm pretty good, it's good to be here. And there is absolutely no need to be nervous. I, I, I don't know why you would be. I'm just happy to be here. I'm excited to be talking to you. Oh, no, that's absolutely brilliant. And uh, thank you for taking the time as well. I mean, it, it's always to have a pleasure on you to join as well, because I know that you're a big Titanic enthusiast yourself, but then also you've been doing a lot of work, really, which um, everyone has been following for a long time, including myself. So it's a really good pleasure to have you on. And um, uh, for those who don't know, who are not in the Titanic community, Tom has done a lot of work with the Titanic. He has a, his own channel called Part Time Explorer and he's been doing some projects about the Titanic, but also he has directed an independent film, which, uh, oh my goodness, I cannot believe it's over 10 years old now, um, called The Last Signals, which um, is uh, based on the true story of the two wireless operators, Jack Phillips and Harold Bride. And I think that's uh, probably all I got to say for your introduction, <laughs> um, Tom, but is there anything else that I missed? Uh, no, I think you've hit the, uh, the big things. Yeah, I um, in some of my projects over the last 10 years, I have had the absolute privilege of befriending some of the best Titanic historians that there are, as well as some descendants from the wreck. And um, I would certainly not call myself an expert or even a historian, but I have picked up a ton of information from these sources. Uh, so I, I'm more than happy to share anything that I might know or uh, understand from them with you. Oh, brilliant. And um, I also um, I also interviewed a historian the other day and um, he mm -hmm. has met you before, Tom. Um, I think his name was Jake, Jake Bill. Oh, you? yes, yeah. yes. Okay. Because you came you. across him in Belfast from what I understand. Yeah, we just bumped into each other right outside of the Titanic Hotel. And that's absolutely crazy. And he, I remember him saying that to me that um, your fiance was a descendant of Arthur John Priest. who He was one yeah. of the Titanic survivors, which is absolutely crazy. <laughs> we had no idea. We actually learned that from Ancestry.com. Um, yeah, so it's, it's just funny because I, I, was, I was putting together a family tree and I was, I was going through mine. I was going through hers and uh, we just... I, I know her mom's maiden name is Priest, and uh, they're from Nova Scotia, and just kind of kept going back into that tree, and then I saw, oh wait, he, the family is actually ultimately from the same town in in Middle England as uh, Arthur John Priest's family. So it's it's more so common ancestor than anything else, but there is a, a connection. That's definitely interesting, and I really couldn't <laughs> believe her when Jake told me this as well. And it, it was just absolutely mind blowing to think that um, that, uh, someone who's very close to you um, is a relative of a survivor of the Titanic. And yeah. I always thought that um, Arthur's story was absolutely mind blowing. And uh, oh, yeah. especially uh, he survived like four shipwrecks as well yeah. and uh, had the connection with two other survivors i can't remember the other guy's name but i know violet jessup is um yeah. one of the out of the three people as well which is mind-blowing so violet's story she's famous for surviving the titanic and the britannic as well as the collision with the olympic um her story is actually uh, far more impressive than just that that's kind of minimalizing her story but Arthur's story also is more impressive than the, the watered down story of Violet Jessup. So the, the two of them actually have a very incredible tale that they uh, 
they don't share, but they, they have a very similar one. Mm, that, 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 that's just so mind blowing to believe, actually. And I know that, um, um, Jake, you've released uh, some unreleased footage of Violet Jessup having an interview um, with one of her <laughs> friends about her experiences on the Britannic, which I would highly yes. recommend listening to, by the way. I mean, it was very mind blowing. And uh, Jake did say he wanted a shout out with that. So, yeah, go check it out if you haven't listened yep. to it yet. It's amazing. And then also, another point to add uh, with some of the questions that I've been asking uh, uh, well I'm going to ask uh, Tom in a minute some of the questions I've been doing research is based on what some people call the Titanic Bible uh, which is um, on a sea of glass and I know uh, yes. that uh, Tom you did a video of the sinking of the Titanic on your channel last year um, that was based on the book uh, yeah, I, I would say actually a little bit more than just based on the book. Um, we made that animation with uh, with the authors, uh, hand in hand, working with them. And uh, they had the opportunity to actually put some of their theories to the test because now they were able to to take some of the stuff that they put into the book and recreate it with us in a 3D environment and see, you know, does this actually hold up? And with this animation, they were able to tweak it a little bit further and um, develop their own research from it. And uh, with that, we, were, we made an animation that we feel pretty confident. It's, it's not 100% correct, but we do feel pretty confident that it's the best out there. And uh, we hope to continue refining it. Oh, brilliant. And that means that's absolutely crazy of how everything uh, just falls into place, really. But so we'll but hopefully yeah. be moving on to the questions uh, because uh, mm -hmm. I know you've got a lot to say about uh, what's your opinions on the whole disaster itself because you have covered it a lot before. And um, even though everyone knows the story about the Titanic, there is some information that was just completely mind blowing. And I thought to myself, yep, got to jump onto these. Before we actually get to the sinking itself we have to really ask ourselves what was the intention for the white star line to build not just titanic but her two other sisters because from what i understand all three sisters were part of the olympic class liners yeah. and the aim of it um was to make them a bit more grander and to compete uh, with several uh, several of uh, the company's um, rivals including yeah. um cunard that's right and you know, our line is actually still around today, by the way. Um, so at the turn of the century, the, the transatlantic trade was constantly one-upping each other. And um, I guess to summarize it, there were three traits that these shipping lines were always trying to achieve. There was speed, uh, luxury, and size of the ship. And uh, of course, safety was always important as well. But uh, White Star Line never intended to compete with, with speed. Um, they gave that up long ago because their ships were constantly getting beat within a couple months of, of launching. So what they were doing was focusing more on size and luxury. So Cunard in 1907 came out with the Lusitania and the Mauritania. Those were the biggest, the fastest, and the grandest ships on the seas. And that same year, White Star Line knew that they had to respond to that with a ship that would beat them for size and luxury. And um, they decided they were actually going to make a class of ships, three ships, all basically from the same template, all built by Harlan and Wolf in Belfast. And the first of these three ships would be the Olympic, followed shortly by the Titanic, built uh, on the slip right next to it. And then once the Olympic was launched, on the Olympics old slip, they would then start building the Britannic. And um, it's, it's unfortunate really, because these ships, two of these ships were robbed of the, the career that they, they truly deserved uh, because they really were grand and they were massive. Uh, they, their initial plans might have put them beyond a thousand foot. Um, I think that was one of the first drawings that they were supposed to be a thousand feet, but that was still unattainable in 19. 12. But uh, yeah, that, that was, it was to answer the Cunards, Lusitania and Mauritania, as well as uh, the German liners. They were, uh, they were quite impressive as well. We sort of neglect them from a modern day standpoint, but those, 
ships were also constantly in the running for speed and size as well. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, um, I was looking uh, the other day on the Olympic story, really, and even <laughs> though uh, both the Olympic and the Britannic were such wonderful ships in their own right, really, I feel that a bit more of the Olympic, or the Olympic was underrated, if yes. that makes sense. Oh yeah. Yeah, the Olympic, um, she went through a good number of changes over her career. Um, she was immediately refit after the Titanic disaster with certain safety improvements and a, a few other things. Um, and then after the First World War, because during the war she was converted into military use, but after the war she was modernized again to uh, fit with the uh, late 1910s, early 1920s styles. And then again, she was refitted in the uh, late 20s. So she was constantly changing, constantly adapting to the time period and was very well loved as she went along. But unfortunately in her last year or so, she simply um, fell into disrepair. Nobody was really sailing on her and, and she was not economical. Uh, economical. Ah, tongue tied, sorry. It's okay, um, don't worry. <laughs> she was not economical anymore. Um, so they retired her. Yeah, and I mean, it's an, it's always sad when a ship comes into the end of its era, really. And it's, it's just heartbreaking. I mean, I personally never traveled on a ship myself, but mm -hmm. it, it's always like it's an end of an era for something, especially if it's something yeah. that's very important. Instead of when you're focusing on the person, you're more focusing on um, the oh the sea industry or the boat industry and and the world really but i know that right. there was another name for the um, shipping industry <laughs> <laughs> but my mind's just gone blank and i really couldn't think of it well, but, a, but, but yeah crew, a ship crew um and and even some of their more common passengers really invest themselves into the ship and and they they feel that the ship has a soul um so seeing a ship go off to the breakers for those who were intimately involved with her, it's almost like watching an old friend um, dying in a way. Mm. Uh, so it's, it's heartbreaking for, for the people who sailed on her. And, and that's not just with the Olympic, that's with the Mauritania, that's with any other ship. I mean, I, was, I just toured a, uh, a freighter that was built in the 70s. And nothing special about it, never carried any passengers, but her crew were retiring her and she was being put to the breakers about a month after my tour. They were all heartbroken. Oh, that means that, that that's just a bit of a shame, really. That what yeah. that happens, really. But um, but as oh, they always say, one door closes, another one opens. But hopefully, um, mm. during like um, in like times, really, in times of COVID, it 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 could change. It happen when everything gets back to semi normal. I don't really think everything's going to get back to normal. But um, if we know. get into the semi normal stage, then. Yeah, so hopefully the shipping industry will probably uh, change for better. But we're going to jump on from there because right. I know that through um, your video on your channel, um, Part Time Explorer, you um, actually so showed some footage and all that from what you explained earlier, um, Tom, about um, how the ship struck the iceberg and then the safety of the lifeboats and all of that, really. And then there was some mathematical stuff involved because I found some bits that I never have heard before, which were really, truly shocking and that I just couldn't believe it happened. But the one question that really stood out for me um, when I was focusing on the sinking of the Titanic was that everyone knows that um, one of the lookouts in the crow's nest, Frederick Fleet, everyone mm -hmm. knows that um, he saw the iceberg first and, there, and at the time he had no binoculars and right. um, it was on a very clear night during, in, on the set of the Labrador Current. But apparently some people have said to me, and, in, and I think you mentioned it on your um, channel as well, Tom, that um, Frederick Fleet, wasn't the person to spot the iceberg first but in fact it was Murdoch but he actually spotted um the iceberg I probably around um 11 37 p.m instead of 11 39 p.m when it was spotted what? but um yeah I was actually quite surprised with the time really but <laughs> what do you think on this Tom what's your opinion on it all right so um first off I want to actually acknowledge a contradiction in um 
I've made two videos, one that says more recently that Fleet spotted the bird first and uh, another one that said that Murdoch spotted first. Um, the reason for that contradiction is actually because I have um, a good friend of mine who is a historian who insists that it was Murdoch who spotted it first. I have other friends who are also very respectable historians who disagree and uh, believe that it was Fleet who spotted it first. And uh, in the recent Honesty of Glass animation, since we were working most closely with the Honesty of Glass crew, they, I, I believe, think that it was Fleet indeed who actually saw the bird right away before Murdoch. And because this was their presentation, they, you know, I went with their, um, their beliefs on that. Personally, I, I don't think we're ever really going to know because there's no one on the bridge, aside from Hitchens, survived. And uh, so it does hold quite possible that, uh, that it was Murdoch on the bridge who spotted it first because he was lower to the, to the water line. Being on the bridge, the bridge is lower than the crow's nest. And he would have more than likely spotted an absence of stars up ahead. And you would have noticed that absence of stars sooner than if you were in the crow's nest because you're, you're looking a little bit more down on the iceberg. And um, so I don't have a strong opinion myself. Um, what that one is, is just uh, depending on who I am working with on that project, I go with them, I defer to them because they are the experts. It sounds like there's a division in between what right. people believe and not, but I, I definitely that I definitely think that's a very interesting point because um I, I know that I never heard of anything like this before and it it does sound like it will always be debatable. What I would love to do is is get these historians who who disagree with each other together and work on an animation together with the two of them and try to to put their arguments to the test against each other. And, and see which one actually comes out the best. And that's one of the reasons why I don't want to have an opinion on this quite yet, because I know both of these historians, these groups of historians are very credible. And I, I just, I want to hold my opinion until I can convince them to do that. Um, because the thing about Murdoch spotting first, it explains the conversation, I think a little bit better. Um, between Moody and Fleet, how he just simply says, what did you see? As soon as the, uh, the, he answers the phone, he knows that they've spotted something. Um, and then he simply says, thank you, very calmly, as if they already are aware. Um, now, Moody would, not have, Moody would not have seen the iceberg. Murdoch would have, and simply given the orders to, of, of evasive action. So Moody would have been a little bit in the dark, but known there was something ahead. So... Him answering the phone, he wants to know what that is specifically, but he already knows there's something out there. So he answers with, what did you see? I, I, I just think that, that the puzzle pieces fall right into place with that theory, but we'll see. I, I want to hold off my judgment on that until I, I can get both sides to really hammer it out. Oh, that definitely sounds like a very good idea. And um, <laughs> if it does happen one day, um, definitely have to keep everyone updated on that. That sure. would be very interesting to watch. <laughs> <laughs> I'd make a video on that if, uh, if it happens. Oh, yeah, definitely. That would be really, really something to watch. And then uh, this is something that always bugs me the most when it comes to the things of the sinking, because um, Everyone's got a lot of debate, historians, mm -hmm. Titanic enthusiasts, it's the lifeboats because lifeboat, it, yeah. it always keeps bugging people from what I have yeah. understand. And th this, this is the several points of it. I thought to myself, why was this the case? What mm -hmm. happened? Because from what I understood is that during the Titanic's maiden voyage, it only had one lifeboat drill, and that was yes. at Southampton. And there was supposed to be another one um, on the morning of the sinking on April 14th, but it was cancelled because um, obviously the captain and the crew didn't want um, the church services to like run overtime. But some people 
think that's the case, but then other historians debate about this. But when it comes to the lifeboats itself, it took almost 80 minutes to release them all. And all the lifeboats, they would carry a third of no number of the passengers. So yes. at the third of the passengers, it's about all of the people that the ship could have. But since um, the, the crew and the captain put more people on board, it made it difficult. But the one thing I found was truly shocking. The number of unused spaces in the lifeboats was 472. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, well, to address the, uh, the most common question first about, uh, about the lifeboats, people ask, why didn't she have that many um, to begin with? Do you want me to go into that first? Because that'll kind of give a little bit of a, a framing for the rest of your question. Oh, yes, go on, yes. Okay, all right. So uh, we like to look at the topic of the lifeboats with the Titanic from modern perspectives. Like, uh, we like to look on that and be like, well, why didn't they have enough lifeboats for everybody? Lifeboats were not really too much of a thought in 1912, and especially prior to that. It was only because of the Titanic disaster that people started to think, hey, you know what, maybe ships should have lifeboats for everybody. That was not a thought prior to that because they're all the way up through history really if a ship sank you were screwed <laughs> their lifeboats weren't going to help you you'd be stuck in the middle of the ocean you were more likely to starve to death and um there was simply very little chance of saving everybody period when a ship went down it wasn't actually until um the invention of wireless technology and the installation of it on board ships that they started having the ability to rescue people from these disasters and the perfect example of that would be the white star liner republic in 1909 only three years prior to the titanic and when she sank she got into a collision and and she started going down but she took a very long time to sink she um it was i can't remember exactly how long it was something like 30 hours it's a very long time and the only people who died were people who died in the initial collision everyone who was still alive they evacuated off they called for help another white star liner the baltic arrived and um when she arrived on scene the baltic launched her lifeboats the republic launched her lifeboats and they went back and forth ferrying everybody off that was what they figured was how all sinking ships would be handled from then on. If you are in trouble in the middle of the water, uh, these ships are now so well built that they're not going to sink fast. And with the wireless technology, you will always be able to call help. And then you only need your lifeboats to go back and forth. And you didn't need enough. You didn't need a seat for everybody because they would be making multiple trips. So that was what they sincerely believed. And the Republic, which sank in 30 some hours, was built by Harland and Wolf, same people who built the Titanic, same designers, same material for the same company. So when they were building the Olympic class, they sincerely believed she was not going to need these many lifeboats, even if she went down. Now they were not as cocky as people like to say today. They did not call her unsinkable. That was actually the media. Um, and they, they, they didn't have the same amount of hubris that people like to project onto them today. They believed that they had enough safety features to make her last long enough to fully evacuate any, her from any disaster. So when the Titanic started going down, they didn't actually know that she was truly sinking for almost an hour. It took them that long to actually assess the damages because the ship was just on the verge of surviving, believe it or not, had, um, had the damage extended not quite so far, maybe like five feet shorter, Titanic possibly could have survived. So it took them that long. Now they were in the middle of a moonless night on a very calm sea in below freezing temperatures and they had no ships nearby. The ship did not have searchlights or anything like that. They were absolutely terrified of putting a bunch of passengers off in these tiny little boats and telling them to stand by because they might not be able to find them all afterwards. 
So they hesitated for quite some time until they absolutely knew that they really, truly were going down. They had the crew on standby uh, that whole time while they were assessing, and they had the uh, wireless operators on standby ready to send out calls for help. But about an hour into the sinking, they finally confirmed that they were going down. And that's when they started the official evacuation, started putting the lifeboats off. But then they faced a few other challenges. For one, nobody wanted to get in the lifeboats. They weren't quite ready to force people into the boats. You have to remember, this is also upper class um, Britain, 1910, uh, 1910s here. Yeah, you can you can tell people what to do, but you can't make them do it. You can't you can't force them into life if they don't want to go. You can't separate families. You can't tell the the uh, women and children that they have to leave their husband and their fathers behind and get into this small boat. You just can't do that. You can ask them politely, and if they don't want to go, then you can't do it. Um, and that was sort of the uh, attitude in the first half hour of the evacuation. So the first boats were being put off with as many as were willing to go into it. And, uh, and then they would row away. And the crew was okay with that for two reasons. They had hoped that these lifeboats would be picking people up out of the water and filling their empty seats from there. And they were also watching the davits. Now the lifeboat davits are the cranes that reach over the side of the ship and, and actually support the weight of the boat and, and lower the ropes down from the pulleys. They were flexing like crazy under the weight of the lifeboats. Now they were designed to take it and the flexing was normal, but they were, um, they were seeing those davits flexing a lot and they were terrified that they might snap. In fact, funny enough, one of the reasons we know that is thanks to James Cameron's film in 1997, because they had exact replicas of those davits made by the same company using the same exact pattern. And they were flexing and they were actually starting to panic on set that they were going to lose a lifeboat and hurt all of these actors in, in, the, in the lifeboats. And um, so thinking about that as an officer standing there, you, you sort of hesitate and you think, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put only maybe half the people into that boat, only the people who are willing to get in. And then those cranes only have to bear half the weight. Now they were always intended to flex, that was normal. It just looks very scary and um, you start to worry. Now, Titanic's crew mostly came off of the Olympic, especially her officers, they came off of the Olympic and um, they had already been well-trained. The officers were all well-seasoned veterans. They had been, some of them had been officers for at least a decade or two. So a lifeboat drill to them was not something they really needed to do. They had drilled on several other ships, including the Olympic. And uh, for all intents and purposes, the Olympic was identical, you know, almost a copy and paste of the Titanic uh, or other way around. But a lifeboat drill was not all that necessary. It was the same boats. It was the same davits. It was the same almost everything. A lot of the same crew as the Olympic. And they already uh, drilled plenty of times on the Olympic. So they did one in Belfast. I think they did one in Southampton. And they skipped the one in the, uh, in the middle of the ocean because... Doing one in the middle of the ocean is inconvenient. You have to stop. The, you have to stop the ship. Um, it's freezing cold now. The temperature was dropping that day, and um, just, they just felt it was unnecessary. It just makes you think, though, um, if they did do the one on the open ocean on the fourteenth, they could have done another one when they were in New York City as well. It, it just makes you think mm -hmm. of a what if. Yeah, I honestly don't think it would have made much of a difference, though, doing mm. one on on Sunday um not really but then also we'll probably jump on into um john phillips and harold bride the two wireless operators because um with the technology that was used at the time they were making especially you've uh, used um in the last signals as well yeah. um what do you think what do you think in in your personal perspective what do you think of their actions that night? Did you think they um, were heroic or were there some things that could have been done or anything like that really? Because I heard one account really from Charles Lightoller that Harold Bright actually tucked one of the telegrams under his elbow from what I understand. Yeah. Um, no, I don't, I don't put any blame on them whatsoever. Um, addressing Lightoller's criticisms, Lightoller was a company man. 
he was re- he was ready to defend the white star line till the very end. And um, the two telegraph operators were not white star line crew. They were actually third party contractors working for the Marconi Telegraph Company. And they were on board. Their job was to transmit passenger telegrams. Mm-hmm. That was their actual job. Now, any anyone working on the sea, anyone working on a ship knows that obviously you also have the duty to um, handle any ship-related traffic, safety traffic to the ship's crew, like iceberg warnings. But their priority was always passenger traffic because that was the paying customer. That is why they were on the ship to begin with. So um, just that setup, just that structure. I mean, they dined by themselves. They had their own little uh, special mess room downstairs with the postal workers, which were also third-party contractors on the ship. They did not dine with ship's crew. They didn't really even mingle with ship's crew all that much. So right from the outset, they were outsiders and very easy to blame for, uh, for the disaster, to de- deflect blame on the White Star Line. And, and frankly, I don't think the White Star Line was truly at fault for a lot of it. I think he was just so ready to fight and so ready to put the blame on someone else. He was ready to deflect, even though, if you think about it a little rationally, there was no need to deflect. But um, it was Phillips. The ac- I believe the accusation was that Phillips failed to deliver um, one final ice warning to Titanic's crew. But they had delivered so many others up until that point. There, I believe there were about a dozen. There, there is an exact number. I can't recall it off, head, uh, off the top of my head. But they had delivered all but one of the ice warnings. And they all pretty much said the same thing ice ahead at these coordinates Uh, some people some ships were stopping for the night to uh, avoid the ice and um, they had delivered most of these messages except the most final one that came in a few hours before the disaster now they were backlogged they had a lot of passenger traffic to get out and this message from their perspective was identical to all the other ones that they had delivered captain smith had actually changed the route of the ship in order to avoid that ice so from their perspective, they probably, they, it was just being redundant at that point. And I, I think it really was. Um, I don't believe Titanic's crew would have done anything different had they received that message. They would have just pinned it up on the board as they did with the other messages. And they would have just gone on with what they did because they thought that they had already done enough evasive action. They didn't realize that the ice field that they were entering actually stretched an additional 20 miles south. Um, because they had, they had steered south to avoid it. So no, I, I don't think that um, the criticisms are valid. I think it's just um, an easy way for Light Toller to try to deflect. Do you think that, um, you, I know with John Phillips that you played him, you had a massive role to play with him when you were in the movie. Do you think that um, in any type of situation, um, do you think that John Phillips was the true hero throughout the whole disaster? Because I know that yes. Harold Bride was, but it was mostly John who actually did the whole wireless operator. Um, like he sent messages and SOSs and CQDs. Yes. And, but despite feeling very tired and not getting enough sleep and then just telling some of the ships to shut up before the iceberg collision happened. Yes. Um, I, I think that Phillips was one of the greatest heroes that night um and more so than bride honestly bride was bride was there he was attentive he was doing everything that phillips needed without question you know phillips needed him to deliver a message to the bridge during the sinking or to go and find the captain and get a message to him or uh go out and see the status of the updates phillips or uh, bride was always ready to do it but it was phillips who was doing the uh most important work Phillips was on the telegraph about 95% of the sinking. Uh, he stepped outside briefly and Bride took over at that point. But it was, it was really Phillips who was doing that. And if, if they had not been working on that, if they had not been doing that, and actually let's back up for a second. Um, the machines broke about 24 hours prior to the, um, to the collision. I, I show that in the film. Um, they were not supposed to fix it. It actually says in their manual and, and in their training 
that if the machines break in the middle of a voyage, you leave it broken. You, you just, you just stop sending it because um, a lot of the operators were geeks, like tech geeks of the time. And they were overconfident and they thought, well, I'm a technician. I know how to fix this. And then most often they would break it worse. So they, um, they were supposed to leave it broken. They broke the rules and fixed it themselves. Had they not done that, they, um, they wouldn't have had a functional wireless machine that night. And I do believe that if they had not been sending those distress calls during the sinking, if they did not have a functional wireless machine, they would not have been able to call for help. And I think far more people would have died. I don't believe there wouldn't have been any survivors. I think they would have been found eventually. But instead of maybe 700, we might have had four or 500 survivors and they would have been found long after. It probably would have taken a few days for them to be found. I think the rescue is to their credit. It's um, it's always good um, to have like a hero like that. But then also it always it always makes me annoyed with the Marconi wireless rules still does. And uh, I never heard of that before until I watched the film. And mm. when I watched it, I thought, organization Marconi wireless. Why did you have to do that? That's the dumbest rules I've ever heard in my life. Well, they um, I, I summarized it a little bit too briefly there they had an emergency set um that ran off of battery and it was pretty much an entirely self-contained transmitter they would have been able to use that but they probably would have already been exhausting it by the time of the collision um had they not fixed the main machine and it also did not have the same amount of range so they might have been able to hail the carpathia they might not have been but they um they certainly would not have been able to be in touch with all the other ships uh, or Cape Race to send updates of, of their status as they were going down. It would have been a very different story. Right, here we go. Okay, so as you may notice that there are scenes that are a little bit different to change and the reason why is because it's Zoom's fault because it decided to be a little bit of like a decision changer really so um hence why um on tom's end the background has changed from what i understand you had a degree that you focused on southampton itself a, a degree what do you mean um like um a university degree oh um i studied maritime uh archaeology actually at the university of southampton but i, I didn't get a degree i just i took a few courses um yes but no i um i had studied pretty extensively the history of southampton though um because i was so for about eight years or so i was the director of the project titanic honor and glory um i actually left a few months ago but one of the things that i had wanted to do was recreate southampton for it as a uh, digital environment. And I actually, I researched it and I, I built it on my own and it did get finished, but um, they're not gonna be using it. They don't wanna go in that direction anymore. And that's fine, that's, that's their prerogative. But um, I did build Southampton as it existed in 1912, at least downtown. Um, it was the docks and then Queens Park, if you're familiar with it. And then beyond that is Oxford Street up to uh, Bernard and Bridge Street. So all of that, which is actually a, a fairly large area, as well as the train station, um, I built that for uh, video game purposes. And I actually still have it. Maybe I'll do something with it someday. I'd actually love to because it was a lot of effort. And I love how Southampton was at the time, because just in that area, that small area of a few blocks of houses, uh, something like 200 or 300 even of Titanic's crew and passengers even called an address within that their final residence before the voyage. I know that um, I did watch Titanic Honor and Glory a few times, but I never knew that it, it was you that created the whole of Southampton, which I, I just couldn't <laughs> believe it because it, it was one of my uh, favorite videos that I watched while you oh, were you. doing the Titanic Honor and Glory. But it's really interesting because 
I've never visited Southampton before, but I'm hoping to at some point. Well, I hope I, I did once I've done the documentary, but yeah. um, it was really interesting because even though I've never been, um, a lot of people have said to me that it has like so much um, stuff to do with Titanic. Mm -hmm. And then even though loads of the bits in the city have changed a lot, some bits are still the same, but apparently yeah. you really can't visit the births um, anymore where the Titanic yeah. sailed and um, this is due to um, from what I believe this is due to uh, conspiracy reasons saying that if you go on the Titanic's birth it's unlucky and but uh, they do show you on the birth there's a orange line that indicates and marks the spot where the Titanic actually was docked before it left Southampton right. But then also, from what I understand, I don't know if it was Cunard that uses it now or another shipping company. So it's still in access. But yeah. there are some bits uh, that are still around, uh, like the, the train um, station. Now, now, I believe now that is a shopping centre from what I understand. But um, there yeah. have been uh, some bits of the houses where all the crew members lived. Some of them have been gone. Some of them are still standing. And it just makes you think how amazing, the, how, how everything has changed. But yeah. I, I would definitely love to go and visit there at some point, really, and just to oh, uh, be, sure. go in there. And then also, <laughs> They have the Sea City Museum, which opened yes. on the centenary of when the Titanic mm -hmm. left. I, I still need to see that, but um, like it, it, it has really, really good stuff over there to oh, yeah. uh, explain about like what Southampton's connection with the Titanic is and the maritime history itself. So yeah, I, I definitely think it's really interesting to see how Southampton actually. Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, they actually uh, made their history come to life despite them changing yeah. stuff all the time. I've never been, been down to the births either. I've been to Southampton a, a few times, actually. Um, from what I understand, it's because it's a functional dock. It's, it's because the whole dock section of Southampton, they're still using it all. Um, Cunard and a few other cruise lines do still act out of the same births of the Titanic. I've seen friends of mine have actually been able to get a tour of Titanic's actual birth. So they do allow some people down there on certain occasions, but probably because it's a functional harbor, they, they keep people out. They don't let the tourists walk down there. You'd be in the way, you could get hurt. Um, there are a good number of things that still remain down there. There's a good number of bollards, um, as well as I think the tracks for, um, for one of those big uh cargo cranes and yes. um the boarding towers those are still there i think in the housing areas a lot of the townhouses that were there at the time especially on oxford street do still exist and on oxford street it's relatively untouched i mean it's been modernized it's it's still a very functional um cleaned up area but some of the buildings are gone uh world war ii was not very nice to downtown southampton uh, so some of the some of the really interesting buildings have been bombed out, but the train station, as you said, is still there. It's a restaurant, and I think it was a casino. I don't know if it still is. Uh, and the hotel, Southwestern House Hotel, which is where Thomas Andrew, no, yeah, Thomas Andrews stayed there right before the voyage, and a few other passengers. I think Ismay as well. They stayed there, and now it's apartments. So that the building still exists. Oh, it's, it's really worth like being there if I, because um, I, I know I've never been. <laughs> but um, yeah, I did um, know that uh, Thomas Andrews went there. And uh, I, I always imagined what it was like if you um, were at the hotel on April 10th and you could see Andrews, Ismay coming out of the hotel room to go on the Titanic. It would have been an amazing sight to see. Yeah, and um, the boat trains would have come right through there as well. So the Titanic had, um, I believe it was three boat trains uh, that came out of London Waterloo Station and went all the way down to the docks of Southampton. And that was for the people who were staying in London or in the area or had other connections from the rest of England. They would have taken this train, which was reserved exclusively for Titanic's passengers, and they would have left Waterloo, I think, around nine, and they would have arrived in Southampton docks at about 
1130, I think, which was kind of cutting it close. Yeah, so the train would have come right through, would have gone behind the uh, hotel. And I think you can still see the railroad crossing where it passes over Canute Road and then heads into the docks and you can still see the gates. And you can stand there and think that three trains pass through here full of passengers bound for the Titanic. That's incredible. And then um, the 500 households, um, they lost a member during the disaster as well. And um, I watched this documentary um, that was uploaded uh, 10 years ago from the BBC. And mm -hmm. um, they had um, the actor who played Captain Smith in James Cameron's yeah. film. And Bernard Hill. I think he said, oh, Bernard Hill, that's the one. Yeah. Um, he said um, uh, that um, it would the the city was the hardest um, part. I uh, know the, the city of Southampton, um, the disaster hit them really, really hard. But I always wonder that if Southampton had the like most big effects um, from the disaster, would it be more than at the other uh, places like Belfast, um, yeah. Queenstown, and now it was Cove or New York City? Well, the um, emotional impact you know really can't be measured in belfast 2000 workers poured their souls into the construction of the titanic and they also knew a, a lot of people who were lost in the disaster perhaps most iconically thomas andrews who was a a, a role model for the whole city so it would have been just as devastating to belfast i would say as it was for southampton but statistically speaking Southampton was the hardest hit out of any city in the world with, um, I, I believe, as you said, 500 lost from that city. So there, that devastation would not have been matched by anywhere else. Interestingly, though, um, the second most hit city in terms of losses, I believe, was Philadelphia, uh, oh. Pennsylvania, which, which is about a half hour that way for me. And um, they had something like 120 people who were on the Titanic, either from Philadelphia or traveling to Philadelphia, some sort of connection to that, um, perhaps even more than New York City. I can't quote how many were on for Belfast. I can say the guarantee group for sure. But other than that, it, it wouldn't have been too many others from Belfast. I, I know a lot of the stewards were from Belfast, but not the rest of the crew, maybe some of the stokers. Mm. But yeah, Southampton was the hardest hit, and Southampton is the city that was so closely tied to the crew of the Titanic. I know that one of the crew members, um, I I never knew her name, but she referred to as Sissy, and uh, she was one of the crew stewardesses um, during the third class passengers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for the third class passengers. And uh, she would uh, teach them things uh, how to use a uh, public bathroom, set with a meal. And uh, eventually I learned that she went down with the ship. And the yeah. reason why she did was because that she wanted to stay with the class passengers and you've got to think as well um she was a widow she had two children that she did leave behind once she was lost in the disaster yet she wanted to stay with the third class crew because to her they were more like her big family even though she only knew uh, some of them for a few days well they were they were her charge they were um she would have felt an enormous responsibility to them um because they would have been coming to her as a almost motherly figure um they would have been turning to her for guidance in a lot of cases, especially those who were not familiar with uh, English or American culture or, or didn't really even know the language. They still would have been turning to her in their broken English or, or, or gestures even to help them out. So she would have immediately had a very strong personal investment with them. And in such a dreadful situation of the ship going down and knowing that most of these were not going to be surviving, she would have felt an enormous attachment and uh, a loyalty to stay with them until the very last, almost like a shepherd or shepherdess. I mean, it, it always breaks my heart really just to uh, hear that story because you just yeah. think that she, she was on her own with no one else with her, yet she did like the bravest thing ever. And I have huge respect for Sissy, I really do. Yeah. And th th she's like one of the most few people that, the story is almost amazing, but 
Uh, and then it's, I could uh, I could go on about it forever, really. And there's so many like people who are just on there. But um, we'll probably move on to the last few questions, just because um, I, there's um, something that. Oh, sorry, Tom. I'm sorry. Can I just touch on one last thing about that? Yeah, I, yeah, I'd love on, to just add on. one last thing. Um, you know, since since earlier I defended the the condemnation of the wireless operators, I wanted to uh, defend the White Star Line on the handling of the third class as well. They were in an absolute lousy situation. The whole, everybody on that ship was in the worst imaginable situation, especially when being set up with the lifeboats there. Um, Titanic's crew were overwhelmed in every conceivable way. The people who were the closest to the lifeboats in terms of passengers were the first and second class. That's just how they happened to be. And it, it wasn't a it wasn't a class issue. It's just, you keep the, highest paying passengers in the center of the ship because it's the most comfortable and you keep the lifeboats in the center of the ship because it's the safest it just happened to overlap the third class unfortunately they had language barriers they had all sorts of other issues and in a panicked situation which titanic disaster pretty much was right from the start they were they were just keeping their panic inside for uh for the first hour or so in that situation you handle who you think you can help and the third class very unfortunately and tragically were the most difficult to help now they definitely didn't abandon them there were a good number of stewards who went down and were pulling them out and actually there were third there were more third class survivors than any other class mm. but there were also far more third class deaths than uh anyone except the crew so um when I when I think about the loss of third class, I blame the circumstances more than any individual or a, even Titanic's crew. It was it was truly the circumstances. Fate was against them in every way. Um, and I think there were a good number of heroes, in, including Sissy, as you you mentioned, who stood by them. Some of them got uh, large groups out. There was a second class priest actually who who saved so many from third class and just they were not left on their own entirely there were a good number of heroes men and women of multiple classes and the crew who stepped up and saved a good numbers of them so i i think that's well worth exploring sometime because there's heroism there's far more heroism to take out of the titanic disaster than than despair and tragedy. Oh yeah, I mean, like um, there, there's so many people you got to have mm. huge respect to, and I yeah. mean, like say for like for what was said earlier, really, Arthur, and Arthur John Priest, he was a very brave um, uh, oh, person. Yeah. But then there, there's just so many others that we could go on about, really. But I know there could be like m like half of the 705 people who survived, or half that <laughs> have sadly perished, and for you sure. definitely got to give huge respect to them. And then. This is going to be the most toughest one for the like, last few questions because I was asking Jake and Sam, um, Sam from Historic Travels, who I interviewed in yesterday's interview, and this was like the questions that were so hard about the discovery of the Titanic because I know that both of them had different views on it. And mm -hmm. then you, you have to really think about how the Titanic's actually going to be preserved. And um, there was one case that I did say to Sam that, um, did you know that the Titanic got hit by a submarine back in 2019? Yes, I, I, I did hear about that. Um... I don't know the details though. I did actually see a newsreel about it before I interviewed Sam. And what happened was that um, the submarine, um, because you know submarines, they can go and travel wherever they want really. Um, apparently they, I think it actually struck at the side of the bow and I believe it was the crow's nest. Um, but uh, I probably might have to rewatch that. And then just because of that, the crow's nest was completely gone. And there are a lot of people who've been debating uh, to like put like barriers around it, even though she's about two and a half miles down, uh, just to make it uh, make the Titanic as a World Heritage Site. From then, this is what from I got from one of the newsreels. Okay, um, I don't think there's any sort of infrastructure or construction that can be done around the wreck. There's that's almost impossible to do. It's it's almost a miracle that we're able to pull artifacts out of it, truly. But I do remember the bumping now. 
And I remember that it was a complete accident. It was this freak water current that nudged the submarine into it. I don't believe there was any noticeable damage done to the ship. And I know that the people who operated the submarine were very, um, you know, they were very forward with it. They were the ones who announced that the bump had happened. They said, this is what happened. It was a complete accident. And um, so they, they took responsibility for it. And I don't believe, I, I do believe that frequent visiting of the wreck is causing it to deteriorate. But I think that what is gained from respectable visits is far more valuable because we're able to learn so much from it. We're able to continue discovering new stories that were lost to, to the sinking. Um, thanks to these visits, we're able to recover artifacts. I am in favor of, of the recovery of, of artifacts as long as it doesn't absolutely, you know, as long as you're not cleaving into the ship and ripping it open to pull stuff out. I am fully in support of preserving things from that disaster. And that helps us maintain the legacy. We also have to remember that people who, it is, a, it is a grave. There were people who are inside of the ship and that's, but they didn't die down there. They died on the surface two and a half miles away. That is the truly hallowed ground above them. Down here, I don't believe it's grave robbing. If, if they were pulling artifacts out to sell and, and make as much of a profit as they could off of it, I would say that's tasteless. You shouldn't be doing that. But when it's going into a museum, when it's being shared with the world, and when this information is being used to further the stories, I think that's preserving their legacy more than anything else. Otherwise, she would be forgotten. If, if we just left everything down there and if we let the ship just fall to the elements and, and decay, I think uh, she'd eventually be forgotten and so would those who are on board. Oh yeah, I definitely 100% agree with you there, Tom. And um, speaking of like the artifacts, because you just reminded me of something, because um, I know there are a lot of museums and places to visit, and um, the one um, uh, that was recent um, in London, which um, which occurred, um, that was the exhibition, um, which was only around between February and March of this year, and I looked at like the trailers for it, and I was so amazed because everything around it was so similar to to the Orlando Museum you've got like the set of the scenes and then the different things I I just really couldn't believe it, it was extraordinary to see and then um, there was a video that did really interest me um about like some of the artifacts and uh, one of them included a little pair of girl shoes that were recovered from the wreck and a lot of people uh, they seem interested in the artifacts but some people I found through social media, they were like, no, don't go into the exhibition, whatever you do. I, I, I hear that it's all haunted mm -hmm. and uh, you'll get very bad omens and experiences there. And it, it's just superstition, but um, yeah. it's just crazy what people think. I think there's very, I don't, I don't know anything about that ex exhibition and I don't know anything about those shoes, but I can, I can draw a parallel actually. In Halifax, in the Maritime Museum of the Atlantic up there, are a pair of baby's shoes. And um, if they pulled these shoes out of the wreck, the, the ones in London, if they pulled those out of the wreck, it's unlikely that someone was wearing them when they died. Maybe. I, I wouldn't know. But odds are someone was not wearing them when they died. They might have been in a suitcase, and that suitcase was recovered, and then they, they put that there to still represent the human element. But up in Halifax at the museum, there is a pair of shoes that was taken off of the body of a little kid, actually oh. pulled off of the body. So the way that they were handling the body recovery is um, they brought about 300 and some bodies to Halifax for processing. And anyone in the world could claim the bodies if they were related and could prove that like they were the next of kin, they could claim the body. And then if they had the means to bring the bodies to a local cemetery or, or, or do with them as, as they saw fit. And the ones that went unclaimed stayed in Halifax. And the, the man who was in charge of this wanted to prevent looting. So he 
anything that was not buried with the bodies and anything that was not claimed by family was burned because they didn't want souvenir hunting. They just oh. burned it all, except for this pair of shoes. He couldn't bring himself to burn it because this was so intimately connected with a, a little child. I don't know the identity of the child. Oh, um, I think I know. I think I know. Sorry, <laughs> the time. I think um, there was um, yeah. oh, what was the child's name? Sid Sydney Goodwin, I think. Yeah, well, that's, that, that sounds that's, familiar. <laughs> yeah, that's well. That that is the formerly unknown child uh, who researchers in Halifax were able to identify by some fluke, honestly, because most of the bodies don't remain. But I don't know if it was Sydney. I don't know if it was off of the unknown child. It was just one of the bodies that were buried in Halifax. It might have been. It might have been. Um, I'm sure the caption of the shoes would, would say it, but I don't remember it. Uh, but still, this is an even more, this is a guaranteed artifact from the body of a child. And it's on display as well. And I've never heard any criticisms of that. I wouldn't criticize it just as I wouldn't criticize the display in London, at least not without seeing it. If they handle it tastelessly, sure. If they were disrespectful with displaying those shoes, sure. I would say that is worth criticizing. But if they're just displaying artifacts, especially if they were likely pulled out of a suitcase, this is telling the human story and this is preserving it. This is, this is the memorial. And maybe you disagree with that and that's fine. But not everyone's going to disagree with that. We're going to move on to one final question because sure. this is something that everyone's been uh, chatting about, really. But in terms of like the Titanic, when you are thinking about if you're interviewing people, um, if you're part of um, online groups, or if you're part of something that you wanted to research for yourself, yep. the Titanic is going to go, the wreck's going yep. to go um um about some people debate when it's going to go anyway but i think some people say about like um not not 20 about 50 years maybe 80 i think it's prob probably going to be 10 myself really? but despite the wreck that is going to be going because mother nature she always claims stuff as her own yeah. how how do you think that if you were telling another generation in somewhere in about like a hundred years time. So if you're focusing up onto um, 21, tw uh, 21, 22, yeah, that's it, 21, 22. Um, how do you think that, how do you think that future generations should remember Titanic? The story of the Titanic or the ship herself? Um, both. Well, I always, I think there's a reason why Titanic resonates with us today. But society is so disorganized and, and so disagreeable with itself. Like everyone has their own opinions about things and then they argue it, defend, like, defend it to no end. I, I think there's a reason why the Titanic resonates among that and why there's this fantastical obsession with it today. And it's because we need role models. Everybody needs role models. And the Titanic gives us that in, in so many different ways. There's heroic men, there's heroic women, there's heroic, um, there's heroic people who are in first class, there's heroes in third class. You can take, you can find the hero that you need anywhere on the Titanic. You, you know, no matter what you're looking for, it, there's somebody's story who, who can resonate with you. Be it, um, you know, if, if you are, depending on your own beliefs, you know, there, there were heroic, um, on board the Titanic, there were people who acted as heroes who their beliefs were, were very secular and, and, and socially progressive. And then there were absolute heroes who were conservative. And there were religious figures who were heroes. And yeah, there, there were some cowards on the Titanic for sure, but they were far outshadowed by the heroes that night. I think that it, it as I was saying earlier, it was, it was the worst imaginable circumstances, but it was one of the best documented and best staged events in history where people of all different backgrounds and all different types 
rose to the occasion and saved lives or they comforted people in their last minutes and they a lot of them gave themselves and that's that's one of the reasons why when you asked me about phillips i gave such a favorable defense of him because yeah sure he made mistakes he if you look into it he 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 was immature at times and so was bride but when when you ultimately look at what they did in the end i would i would defend their overall story um beyond any of their criticisms because they saved lives in the end and even lightoller who condemned them lightoller was a hero even though he certainly could have saved far more that night um it is a story that can inspire people in any way that they want to interpret it. And I think that's what resonates. Well, that's definitely a really good answer there, Tom. I, I have to admit, though, I, I, I really feel, felt like I almost cried. <laughs> 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 I, I know, right? it sounds ridiculous, but no, no. I, I just thought it was just so touching. And I really do agree. There were a lot of heroes and then there were yeah. a lot of cowards as well. But yeah. I can remember Jake actually said to me, um, he thought Murdoch was the hero of the night uh, for spotting that iceberg, which, which uh, I I tend to think it was really interesting because no one's ever touched on that before. No, oh, Murdoch. Um, in terms of the officers, Murdoch was the the real hero. In, in terms of her officers and her 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 uh, highest ranked crew, Murdoch outshined everybody. Now, Captain Smith and Officer Wild what they truly did during the night we won't know for sure because they were lost in the sinking but murdoch murdoch was the most interactive with people and even though he went down with the ship too there were so many eyewitnesses smith and wild seemed to have disappeared uh for a little bit they they never neglected their duties we know where they were roughly active but but murdoch himself was responsible for saving about two-thirds of those who lived because the women and children law of the sea um he interpreted in a very reasonable way it was women and children first and then anybody else you fill up the seats with anybody who you can you you try to minimize the empty seats that are leaving the ship lights all are interpreted it very literally women and children first and then if any men want to survive they're going to have to swim for it and then ironically he survived um so Two thirds of those who got away from the ship, especially in terms of men, have Murdoch to thank because he was reasonable. He he was cool headed the whole time. I don't believe he shot himself as um, as the James Cameron film showed. Um, I, I definitely don't. I do believe somebody did. It might have been Officer Wild, um, but I don't believe it was Murdoch. But yeah, I agree with Jake on that. Jake said it right that Murdoch was one of the heroes that night. I, I definitely agree with like Murdoch and everyone was uh, true heroes in their own right really so we've got to give them a lot of credit for that yeah. but Tom it's a pleasure been talking to you in the podcast thank you so much for coming on and it, it was an absolute honor but I think the nerves have died down a little bit. <laughs> Good. Well, I'm happy to be here you, you definitely have nothing to be nervous about this was great if you ever want to talk again I'm more than happy to all right. Oh, that'll be great. Thanks, Tom. And um, yeah, so I will be continuing with my Titanic interviews uh, later okay. on um, this week. And then I'm going to have another special guest on tomorrow. But I will set a date for the documentary then because, um, yeah, I, I won't tell yet because it's a surprise. But until okay. then, everybody, I will catch you tomorrow in the next Titanic special podcast. Take care of yourselves. Bye.